good. Excellent. Well, I'm going to carry on. Um, this is now our third section, and we're going to be looking at Adam's work before the fall. And in the last session, I mentioned that God, when the word for work in Genesis 2 is used of God, it means that he, he, his creation represents him. And the pinnacle of his creation is Adam and Eve. James, in his epistle, says that we are the first fruits, the very pinnacle of what God made. And so we have a particular importance uh, or a particular responsibility to represent God in the way we work and in our lives as a whole because we are his representatives. So we are made in his image, in the image of God, and our task is to make the invisible God visible and to mirror or mimic what he is like to a world. Okay? So in Genesis chapter 2, we see three aspects or three realms that God has given to Adam to represent him. And by which, by, and through these realms, through these means, we're able to bring the life of heaven to earth. Because that's where God lives in complete now, in complete perfection and in complete glory and in complete wholeness. So we are instructed to help bring something of that life to earth in its, fallen, in, in its now fallen state. And these three spheres that God has brought to us is our marriage, our family, and our work. But it's interesting to me that the first thing that God brings and gives to Adam is, is, is his work. He gives Adam work first before he gives him a wife which is an interesting thing, because maybe Adam didn't realize he needed a wife. <laughs> but he was given a wife because he recognized the need as he began to fulfill the work that God gave him to do. So God then gives Adam this sphere, and he places him in a garden. And the word garden there in the Hebrew language means a hedged garden. It was, or a walled garden. So it wasn't completely open. It wasn't uh, the entire world. It was a specific sphere or particular place. And it had an extent, a parameter, a limit. So God, when he gave Adam responsibility, he placed certain restrictions or limitations upon the sphere that he gave Adam to, to, to govern and to rule because he understood Adam's limitations. So God gave then Adam these, gave him this responsibility and he places him in this garden and he tells him to cultivate and keep it, right? So as I mentioned earlier in one of the earlier sessions, the word that Adam's work is a bud or which is also used for one of the words for worship. Thanks very much coming in, that's very good. I've now got a balanced <laughs> audience to speak to, and this is wonderful. And Adam was instructed to do two things with this garden. He was instructed to cultivate it, and, and he was instructed to guard or keep it. And, and, though, and, and to cultivate, from that word, we get the word culture. In the Septuagint, when it's translated, that is the word which, from which we get the word human culture. And all cultures have an expression. And they all express something of the beauty and goodness of God. Even in their fallen state, there's goodness within the cultures that we're a part of. Even though there is also, a, you know, a corrupted part. So uh, uh, an important aspect of, of Adam's job was to cultivate this ground. And he was instructed to grow things. And he was instructed to develop the soil. So Adam lived in this, in this, in this state, and the soil and the, work, the earth was cooperative with Adam's attempts to bring forth a crop. And Adam lived off that. But then in the book of Genesis, we're, in chapter 2, we're told that in this garden, there were all kinds of gold and precious stones and other wonderful things which he could extract from the ground. So Adam was given all kinds of resources by which he, was to, which he was to work with to develop 
this ground and to, to develop this garden to bring beauty, to bring food, to bring productivity, to be creative, to express something of that which God had placed within him to reveal the glory of God. And I'm sure that you would agree with me in all the cultures of the world, through their art, through their different expressions, through the materials that they make, through their prints, through their dance, through their language, through their song, there is something that is continually speaking of that glory of God, which is coming out of the hearts of people, whether they know it or not, because we are being creative with that which God has given us to use. So Adam was instructed to cultivate a garden. And, but the interesting thing here is that the first day of Adam's life was a day of rest. When was Adam created? On the sixth day. What happened on the seventh day? God rested. So Adam wasn't working for something. He wasn't working for rest. He was working from it. In chapter 1 that I read earlier, God blesses Adam and then says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule. So the subduing and there was some subduing to do, and ruling, and governance, and order, and all the things that God gave Adam to do, all followed the blessing. And in our lives, we will have a, we'll work from blessing, from rest, or we'll work for it. And by and large, the, work, the world works for it. When are most people paid? After their work, right? When a, <laughs> absolutely. So they're working for the pay. Beloved, as Christians, you aren't. God will honor you. you he's using your skills and abilities to, to help remunerate you, yes. But you're working from a place of blessing and from a place of rest. You're not striving to find something. And that's why until of recent weeks... <laughs> people took, were taking more and more exotic holidays in distant places, walking with the barbers in North Africa in the Atlas Mountains or living out with a family in a longhouse in Borneo or, you know, off to Thailand or Mauritius or wherever it was. They were all doing that. What were they going there for? To escape something. They were trying to escape <laughs> the world of work <laughs> and find a little respite in the midst of all the challenges and difficulties that this life throws at them. They have, they have no concept that they're working from the blessing and from rest. So God wants us to learn and helped Adam to learn that the first priority is receiving our purpose, our call, our identity, and, that, and recognizing the creativity that he's placed within us, and then beginning to use that to be a blessing to others and to reveal his glory. So Adam then was instructed to cultivate and to keep this garden. And he was given a sphere of responsibility. And that was the first aspect of Adam's work. The second aspect of Adam's work is he was told to name all the animals. Now all these animals, many of them, many of the mammals and the fish and so on, they come in pairs. They came two by two. And here is Adam on his own. And he's naming all these animals. And there's a, a male lion and a female lion, S. And there is, you know, uh, well, the birds are particularly different, but, you know, so he... he He's naming all these animals, and, and that was work. If you, in case you don't think it was work, there are 250,000 species of insect in the world. So he's having to come up with names. He's having to recognize that they have different family and different genesis and different, different order and different communities. And so he's having to learn a lot about biology and zoology, right? And halfway through this, it begins to dawn on him, all these are coming in pairs, but I don't have a pair. 
And it's as he realizes his need that God says something. Now, this is very, very interesting. You know, God will never give you something before he shows you your need for it. Right? I can give you numerous examples, even the Ten Commandments. There was recognition of need, and there was a request, there was an ask. You know, a nation is being formed out of a family, and now they need more order, and there was a reckoning, we're going into a land of promise, we need guidance, we need direction. The rich young ruler is a very good example of a person who has helped to see his need. He comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, keep the commandments. He says, which ones? And Jesus names five. Have you ever noticed that? He starts with, I think, you shall not murder, and he goes through five, and honoring your father and mother, and you know, all those. But he leaves, he, leaves, he leaves very important ones out. He leaves all the ones to do with God directly out, and he leaves the last one out. What's the last one? You shall not cover. Why did Jesus leave that one out? Now, let me tell you, that would be the first one that this rich young ruler would have learned because all the Ten Commandments were written on his doorpost. And as he grew up, when he, the first one he would have begun to read when he was a little boy was you shall not cover because it's the bottom of the list. So he goes away thinking, why has Jesus left that one out? And his last instruction to this young man was, go sell your, your hair and come follow me. He's helping this young man realize he has a need that he's coveting. And there is an early church tradition, we don't know quite how true this is, that that young man was Barnabas the Apostle, who later came and sold a tract of land and laid all the money at the Apostles' feet so that they could minister to the to the poor and the needy and the, and the refugees who were coming into their community and all those who had come for the feasts from all over the world and were now needing help and support and accommodation and food and things. So God, God was showing Adam that he had a need. And then he says this statement, which is really amazing. It's not good for man to be alone. So everything else that God has made is good. Why didn't God just give Adam a wife straight away? because he wouldn't have seen the need. He would have tended to abuse her or take her for granted, overlook the skills that she could bring. But he's confronted with his need. He's naming the animals. He's trying to cultivate the ground. He's trying to bring out beauty. He's trying to, you know, mine some gold so he can make rings or whatever the case may be, finding the precious stones. And he's going about all of this and he's confronted, I need help. I need help. So when he sees his wife, he says, she's my help need. And she's come from me. She's my heart. She's come from that which I am. And so we see then that Adam, that Adam is used by God to help expose a need. And the amazing thing to me is that God created the world good but not perfect or complete. Because something was incomplete. And that principle is throughout the Scripture. God often knows exactly what he's going to do, but he requires a man to do his little part. So, Moses is complaining at the edge of the Red Sea. Water in front, Egyptians behind. What does God say? What's in your hand? God just doesn't do it all. He wants Ad Moses to cooperate and to take his responsibility in helping do what needs to be done. Then you've got the woman whose, whose sons are about to be sold into slavery, and she comes to Elisha and says, Elisha, help. And he says, what have you got in your house? Amen. And she says, I've only got this little bit of oil. Elisha says, God can make that into more than enough, but you need to, put, you need to pour that into the miracle into the mix. Then he's at the Sea of Galilee with his disciples. He's risen from the dead and they've gone fishing and they haven't caught any fish all night. <laughs> Again, 
because <laughs> you know? he wanted to help them know that they were really not very good fishermen <laughs> and they had a better call on their lives. So they come to the shore and, 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 and then John recognizes it's Jesus and they cast their nets on the other side and they get more fish than they can count. But then there's breakfast on the beach. Jesus has already made a fire and he's already cooking some fish. But there are not enough. Why not? Didn't Jesus know how to get enough fish out of that sea? Of course he did. But he wanted them to be a part of breakfast. So he says, you bring some of the fish that you've caught. And of course they haven't really caught any, but that, that's another factor. They'd been obedient. They'd learned. Right? So here we have just a number of examples where God creates things good but not complete. And this is the first one that I have found in the Bible where the whole of creation is fantastic, but then suddenly right there, before the fall, before any corruption has come into this wonderful world that God has made, something's not quite complete. And, and that is a principle that you can see running through all of Scripture. There are many other examples. And, and that is a lesson to us all in our own lives. So Adam is given the job of naming the animals, and he's given a job of cultivating this garden, but he's also given the job of keeping it or guarding it. And that is where Adam abysmally failed. Because the enemy then comes and then begins to sow questions and doubt into Eve's mind and a promise which is a, a half-truth, which she buys and they eat from the tree, as you know, and Adam failed to guard and protect his wife. You know, where was, where was Adam when Eve was being tempted? Right next to her. It's not as if he wasn't able to interrupt that process and say, no, Eve, this is not what we're going to do. But he didn't. Later on in the, in the law, in the book of Deuteronomy, God makes it quite clear that if a wife makes a promise or sells something and the dad comes home, husband comes home and says, no, that's not going to be, it's not going to be. Because she needs that protection. Because though she's a wonderful helpmeet, she has vulnerabilities just as Adam does in different, in different areas. And therefore, he needed to protect her. So he wasn't there, to, he wasn't doing his job. He wasn't guarding this garden. He wasn't the gatekeeper that God had called him to be. So, in this, in this section then, we've been looking at how God has given Adam specific responsibilities and that Adam went about them in, in, a, in a way that enabled God to reveal himself through Adam's creativity and, and also then begin to reveal to Adam that he had a, had a need that he hadn't yet seen so that he could begin to cry out and ask God for, for an Eve to be his partner in the work. And we also talked about the fact that Adam worked from rest, not for it. Now, this is really so, so fundamental. Let me just reiterate this, as I shared with some, some folk in the break. You know, when Jesus came to this earth, we, he, he was born into a poor family, and he worked faithfully with his hands as a laborer, builder, and carpenter, for 30 years. But before he had started his messianic ministry, he had an encounter with his father and his cousin on the Jordan at his baptism. And when he's baptized, which means basically he was setting himself aside as Messiah for the work that God had called him to do, when he was baptized, the heavens were opened. Bill Johnson talks about this very well. I mean, that, that, you know, the Bible, when it says open, it doesn't do justice to the word. In the, he, in the Greek language, it's rent apart. That, that whole heavens were torn asunder. And then this dove, and, I, and, you know, I'm convinced we got the wrong idea of a dove because we just see this little thing coming down on, on Jesus. I'm sure it was a massive great dove, you know, double the size of a large eagle, coming down out of heaven, you know, and, and, and resting over Christ. And then the words are spoken by his father, this is my son, whom I love, in whom I'm well pleased. Now that speaks to me of three essential needs that all humanity have, that Jesus identified with 
in his walk on our behalf. It speaks of acceptance. This is my son. This is not a son. This is not anyone else's son. This is not even Mary and Joseph's son. This is my son. So this is speaking to us of Jesus' acceptance in the Father. Then he says, whom I love, which speaks of his affection for Christ. Before anything else, he was loved. And then he says, in whom I'm well pleased. And that is before he's preached a message, done a miracle, fed the multitudes, you know, raised the dead. It, it, he had lived a life of complete perfection before his father in all the requirements that father had made. And, and he had learned obedience through the things he suffered and struggled with on that journey. And so we see that God gives Jesus, a, before his ministry begins, acceptance, affection, and affirmation. Jesus worked from the blessing. Most Christians haven't a clue. They're working for the money. They work for, for the income so they can look after a family, but they have no idea of the purpose that God has for that work because all they see is the paycheck. And then the labor becomes more and more onerous. It becomes more demanding. It, they lose sight of the vision. And where there is a lack of vision, the people are unrestrained. They don't have a sense of identity and they don't have a sense of purpose. So in Father's plan, before the fall, God places in Adam the blessing and gets him work, gets, gets, encourages him to work from rest into the fulfillment and the blessing. And from the blessing and from that encouragement and from that place of acceptance, from that place of identity, and, and Adam was able then to go about his work and his task. Sadly, he fell. He didn't protect his wife. He didn't re ad address the enemy when he came to deceive and to delude. And he failed to take the authority that God had given him as guardian and gatekeeper. And we'll have a look in the next section at what the consequences were to work. Now let me re reiterate, as we've been seeing here, God gave Adam plenty of jobs before the fall. <laughs> right? <laughs> he gave him plenty of jobs. So the first person working in the Bible is God. The second person working in the Bible is Adam joined by Eve, and then finally we have a look at work after the fall, and we will see that it wasn't work that was the curse, ground was cursed, Amen. right? So the work that God was giving to Adam wasn't the curse, that was a blessing. That was to reveal the glory of God and to be a blessing to all mankind, to be a blessing to his family, to feed his household, and to reveal the beauty, the creativity, and the glory of God in the limited capacity that God had given him to do. But after the fall, there are profound changes to Adam's work, and we'll have a look at that in the next section. Thank you.